<laughs> so Eric is from um, Newmarket, Ontario, originally. He did his undergraduate at McGill before going to Wisconsin Madison, where he um, worked with Carrie Forrest on the Madison Dynamo experiment. Um, and when he was finished there, he went to the ETH Zurich, where he's been since last autumn. Um, and he's been working there on, on simulations of um, various um, liquid metal experiments, amongst other things. And he recently won uh, the Marshall N. Rosenblut, if that's pronounced correctly, prize um, for the best plasma physics thesis. Thank you. Good afternoon. As John mentioned, my name is Eric Spence. I'm at ETH Zurich. Um, and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the measurements and simulations we've been doing of the Madison Dynamo experiment. What I'd like to do today is do sort of an overview talk to sort of give you the big picture of what motivated the experiment, what sort of uh, flows we were after when we built the experiment, uh, and, and now the ongoing uh, theoretical work that we're doing on the experiment now that the experiment is not quite uh, performed as we had hoped it would. Um, so I hope to cover all of those topics today. A uh, brief outline of my talk first, as I said, we'll talk about the motivation for the experiment, why we built it, and a little bit of dynamo theory. Uh, this is, uh, of course, MHD dynamo theory, geophysical um, excited magnetic fields, as well as stellar magnetic fields and whatever your favorite uh, astrophysical object happens to be. And then I'll talk about the experiment itself, which I helped build and uh, get operating. First, we'll talk about the water model then moving on to the actual sodium version of the experiment and some of the data that we took when I was still in Wisconsin. And then we'll do a little bit more theory with some simulations of the experiment, trying to understand why the experiment does not magnetically self-excite as we had hoped it would, and some uh, interesting simulation results that I've uh, had since that time. So as you saw when you came in, I like this movie. It's a lot of fun. The, um, so this is the reconstruction of the Earth's magnetic field at the core mantle boundary over the last 400 years. You can see the date at the top of the screen. Um, this data was reconstructed from uh, magnetic field measurements made on the surface of the Earth for the most part. It was also reconstructed um, mostly from mariner observations. You might be wondering, how on Earth do we get magnetic field measurements back in, in uh, 1630? Well, uh, England in particular, as well as the Dutch and the French, had ships going all over the Earth. And at that time, they were taking magnetic field measurements every day as they plotted their courses. And so these logs still exist. And you can reconstruct, at least to some accuracy, what the Earth's magnetic field has been doing in that time. Now, what you can see from this animation is that the Earth's magnetic field is very dynamic. There's a lot going on. We've got large patches of flux going into and out of the surface of the Earth, um, patches going in all sorts of directions, as well as the typical westward drift we expect from the more modern observations of the Earth's magnetic field. And so there's a lot of physics here that we would like to get a handle on. As we know, the Earth's magnetic field is uh, generated by the flows of liquid iron in its core. And so it seems natural to study uh, liquid metal um, systems from a magnetohydrodynamic point of view in an attempt to understand the physics of magnetic self-excitation in liquid metal systems as well as other types of dynamo systems where this applies, such as plasmas and other sorts of things. So this was the basic um, original motivation for the experiment, to understand how liquid metal systems can magnetically self-excite. Um, uh, as we know, theory and observations of all sorts of astrophysical objects show that magnetic fields are pretty much, pretty much ubiquitous throughout the universe. And so it is a good idea to get a handle on how are these fields being formed. So the goal of the experiment is to construct an experiment that is capable of magnetically self-exciting and doing so in a liquid metal system as opposed to a plasma system or some other um, electrically conducting fluid, though none comes to mind off the top of my head. Anyway, in a liquid metal system, and so that we can study both the aspects of dynamo theory that apply to liquid metals as well as as um, explore other types of magnetohydrodynamics that 
are appropriate for such systems such as MHD turbulence and how turbulence modifies um, magnetically self-exciting systems. So a quick, quick overview of the theory. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. This is the magnetic induction equation, which describes the evolution of the magnetic field of a magnetohydrodynamic system. Um, on the left-hand side, of course, is the time derivative of the field. We've got two terms in the equation. The first term is the advective term. This is the source of magnetic field energy. And on the right-hand side, on the far side there, you can see that we've got a diffusive term. This is where you're going to be diffusing away your magnetic field ohmically. Now, if we non-dimensionalize the equation and then assume that our velocity field is static and take an exponential time dependence, we have this equation here, a modified version of the original one. And as you can see, the equation has been reduced to a uh, linear eigen, uh, eigen equation where lambda is the growth rate of the magnetic field and the only parameter, the two parameters we have are the velocity field, which we have not yet specified, and the magnetic Reynolds number, which is the scaling factor that gives you the um, ratio of the uh, advective term to the diffusive term. So the goal of your theory, when you're starting to think about, well, how am I going to build myself a, a liquid metal experiment that's going to magnet magnetically self-excite, what you want to start to think about is what sort of velocity field can I come up with in whatever geometry you care to think about it in? What sort of velocity field can I come up with such that this growth rate, or at least the real part of the growth rate, is going to be positive? Because if you have a positive value for your growth rate, you're going to have a growing eigenmode, and then you're going to have magnetic field self-excitation, and you win. So that's, that's the goal that we're after here. Now, of course, this also depends on the magnetic Reynolds number, the scaling factor between the advective term and the diffusive term. And for those of you who don't remember, it goes like the conductivity of your fluid. Uh, a is a length scale, and V0 is a characteristic speed. So while the Earth um, doesn't really win in the terms of conductivity, liquid iron is not extremely conductive, um, and it certainly doesn't really win in terms of a characteristic speed on the order of well, kilometers per year, tens or hundreds of kilometers per year in the core, um, it's going to win on size because it's big. Now, we can't build an Earth, um, so that's out, but maybe we can come up with some other way of maximizing this quantity, the re magnetic Reynolds number, such that we can get um, values of lambda that are positive. So people have been thinking about this problem for a long time, and originally the types of flows that people started to think about were not axisymmetric flows. I stole this figure from Kageyama's simulations, um, where he does simulations of uh, Earth-like planets, the cores of Earth-like planets, um, to demonstrate one of the reasons why they uh, wanted non-axisymmetric flows. And the reason for that is because everyone was well aware of in the 50s and 60s when they were thinking about this, of Cowling's theorem, where Cowling's theorem says that if your velocity field is axisymmetric, you can't get a magnetic field that's axisymmetric in a dynamoing situation. And what people were after in those days was really something Earth-like. We know that the Earth's magnetic field at the surface of the Earth is predominantly axisymmetric for the most part. There are higher order components, of course, but for the most part it's axisymmetric, so they wanted to start with a system that would generate dynamos with axisymmetric magnetic fields. And they were successful. There are many different flows that have been found in a sphere that are not axisymmetric that will give you growing magnetic fields via the equation we saw on the last slide. However, if you're an experimentalist and you're sitting down trying to think about, well, how am I going to build myself a liquid metal experiment? What sort of flows can I conjure up that are going to be uh, physically realizable in and not, uh, you know, without too much effort, you can imagine that something like this, where these are um, contours of constant vorticity, this is going to be probably a little hard to generate. That's not, it's not obvious to me just sitting down and thinking about it, how the heck am I going to make that? So um, early flows were, made, came up with, you know, good theory, but it wasn't necessarily something that we could realize in an experiment. 
And then along came Dudley and James in 1989. They came up with this new idea. They said, okay, well, let's just forget about this earlier constraint about having non-axisymmetric flows. Let's just deal with the basic physics first and worry about the, the specific case of the Earth later. And let's say, okay, well, let's come up with an axisymmetric flow profile that's very simple. So that's, this is the flow profile they came up with right here. Your axis of symmetry runs horizontally. <clears throat> In the upper hemisphere, you've got your rolls of poloidal flow in the poloidal direction. So we've got rolls inward at the equator, outward at the poles, doing these simple rolls. And then in the toroidal direction, we've got flows that are going in opposite directions in each hemisphere. So if you sort of imagine what this flow looks like in three dimensions, you're going to have two counter-rotating vortexes in each hemisphere. This is your axis of symmetry, so this is your equator. So in each hemisphere, you're going to have these two um, vortices rotating in opposite directions um, against one another. So Dudley and James came up with this very simple flow, threw it into that equation. Well, here it is, this equation here. And lo and behold, you can see that after your magnetic Reynolds number passes some critical value, the critical magnetic Reynolds number, you do get positive values. This is growth rate versus magnetic Reynolds number here. So, all right, cool, all right. So maybe, maybe we can pull this off. Maybe this will work. You can see that this is a flow that if you're an experimentalist and you're thinking to yourself, well, that maybe I can do that. Maybe I can make a flow that does that. It's very simple. It's not too complicated. I can, I can do that. And so this was the in inspiration for the, the Madison experiment. Now, before we move on to the experiment, I just want to sort of explain how this flow succeeds in magnetically self-exciting. So what, you, what you, you see here is two field lines on either side of the equator of that flow that I just described, just slightly off axis of the equator. Now what this animation that I'm, I'm going to start in a second is going to show is what happens if we assume the frozen flux approximation and that the field line is stuck to the fluid element. So the, the field lines are going to be stuck to the fluid elements and you're going to see them go with the flow and you'll see what happens in terms of why this system succeeds in magnetically self-exciting. So what you're going to see is this field line is going to get pulled out towards the poles by that poloidal flow, and then it's going to get wrapped around by the toroidal flow, and then it's going to take that flow and lay it right back on top of the original field line that we started with. Now obviously in a real experiment this is not quite how things are going to work because we've assumed, as I said, the frozen flux approximation. After a certain point, diffusion is going to kick in and cause these field lines to rearrange themselves into a more topologically similar um, system. But you can understand how this magnetic eigen mode works, right? The flu fluid just takes the magnetic field line, twists it around, gives it energy, and then lays it back on top of the original field line, thus reinforcing it. The other thing you'll probably note sort of just intuitively is that the ratio of the poloidal to toroidal flow has to be pretty good for this to work properly. You need that folding, the twisting, and the laying back on top of the original field line to be just the right ratio so that your field line ends up on top of what it started with instead of some other combination which ends up somewhere else. So these are things we all have to keep in mind when we start to look at the experiment and think about how it's going to work. <clears throat> this is what the magnetic eigen mode oh, looks like. There it is. If you do a full simulation, this is what the eigen mode looks like if you let it develop with diffusion after it's magnetically self-excited. And as, as I mentioned, this is a, a uh, the magnetic field lines go across the equator and that's what we call an equatorial dipole, a dipole sticking out of, the, out of the equator of the experiment. This is what we would expect, of course, for a system that has an axisymmetric velocity field. It doesn't violate Cowling's theorem because the magnetic field is not axisymmetric now. It sticks out of the equator at some particular angle. Okay, so this was, this was Encouraging. Maybe we can do this. Can we produce these flows in the laboratory so that it will maybe magnetically self-excite? Again, we remember that our control parameter is the magnetic Reynolds number. And so we want to maximize this quantity in the hopes of getting 
growing magnetic field. So our three pieces that we have control over, if we ignore the permeability of the fluid, which for almost everything is um, u naught, then we've got the conductivity to work with, the size, and some characteristic speed. So this brings us immediately to liquid sodium. Why do we always build our experiments out of liquid sodium in the liquid metal physics community? And the reason for that is mostly because of this first reason here. It has the highest conductivity of any liquid metal. And this makes it obviously the best candidate for maximizing our magnetic Reynolds number. It also melts at 100 Celsius. That is very reasonable by metal standards. If you're trying to melt liquid iron, you're going to be at like 1,500 Celsius. That's really hard to do. And the technology for handling sodium is fairly well developed. Sodium is used as the coolant in the next generation of nuclear reactors in the United States, France, and Russia. Um, and so we stole a lot of technology from them so that we could figure out how to handle this stuff because it's good to have people who've already figured out how, how, how to do that. <clears throat> how big does this thing have to be? Well, if you do the simple math, if this is your conductivity and you know mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7, then, okay, if our radius is about a half a meter, then we need speeds of about 16 meters per second, which sounds kind of big, and it is kind of big, but we can probably pull it off in the experiment if we have enough power, about 100 kilowatts or... To, uh, 150 horsepower if you prefer um, horsepower. This of course gives us a magnetic Reynolds number of 100 which is well above the critical magnetic Reynolds number of 50 that we saw for the Dudley and James flow. So maybe we're in good shape. Maybe we can do this. This looks like it's something that can be, can be attainable. So this was the basic motivation for the experiment. And if you're a, a liquid metal experimentalist first thing you do before you build yourself a liquid sodium experiment is you build yourself a liquid water experiment because liquid water is a lot easier to handle. Now it turns out, if you look at this table of uh, parameters here, not parameters, physical quantities, excuse me, um, you'll notice that the density and the viscosity of sodium, liquid sodium and water are very, very close to each other which is a very interesting coincidence. Wa uh, sodium is slightly less dense than water. Otherwise, hydrodynamically, they're identical. So if we build an experiment out of water and study its flows, which is a lot easier to do than in liquid sodium, you can study its flows, figure out uh, how to get just the right flows so that in theory it should dynamo. You can do this in a water experiment, and then after you know what you're doing, or think you know what you're doing, you can build the real deal. So that's what we did. We built a one meter diameter sphere of liquid water. It's identical to the sodium experiment in the important ways. The biggest difference, of course, you can see right here are these windows that were built into the experiment. The purpose of this, of course, is to use laser Doppler velocimetry to study the flows of the water so that we could develop the propellers just right inside the machine so that it would generate the flows that would give us the velocity field we were after. Um, so we can take the velocity fields that are generated in this experiment and stick them into that equation we saw earlier and then crank up our magnetic Reynolds number and say yes indeed if we put in enough power up to about 100 kilowatts we should be able to reach a point where the magnetic Reynolds number is high enough these flows should magnetically self-excite. You don't really need to watch what most of these plots are doing. This one's kind of interesting. You can see the magnetic Reynolds number at about 100 kilowatts creeping up past 90. And this is the amount of power. Again, we have 150 kilowatts, so we're out there somewhere. So this was encouraging as an experimentalist when your development of your experiment comes along nicely and you say, oh, OK, this is no problem. We can, we can build this. This will be great. And so we did, which brings us to the Madison Dynamo experiment in Madison, Wisconsin. One meter diameter sphere of liquid sodium. The impellers you see here generate an axisymmetric velocity field not unlike the Dudley and James velocity field that we saw earlier. And we can apply magnetic fields to the experiment using a pair of external field coils um, for examining different types of phenomena um, related to the magnetic field. <coughs> the magnetic field is measured with two sets of probes. First, these little knobbies you see on the outside of the sphere here. These are um, 
radial magnetic field probes. They measure the radial component of the magnetic field at the surface of the sphere. Using these probes, we can reconstruct the, uh, the magnetic field everywhere outside of the sphere um, due to the, fl the currents inside the sodium and due to the currents uh, in the coils. For magnetic measurements inside the sphere, you have to be a little more careful. Liquid sodium, for those of you who remember your high school physics class, liquid sodium is, reacts very violently with water, so you've got to be careful um, because you're a big bag of fuel for a fire. You don't want any accidents to happen. But if you're careful, you can stick probes inside your sphere, and you can measure the B phi or B theta components of the magnetic field that are inside the sphere to give you a complete picture of what the magnetic field is doing, at least inside the volume of the sphere that you're capable of measuring. This is what the, sphere, the experiment looks like itself. I apologize, it's a little dark. The, um, the big snowball you see here is the sphere. It's coated in uh, white insulation because, as I mentioned, the sodium melts at 100 Celsius, so we need to heat up the experiment. And of course, we insulate it to keep it warm because otherwise it would really heat up the room. Uh, you can see one of the magnetic field coils here that apply the axisymmetric field. We also have coils here and over here just peeking out um, to apply a transverse uh, magnetic field to the experiment. The purpose of this field is to uh, explore the magnetic eigenmode that we expect to be associated with the flow we're dealing with. Here you can see the bearing shaft assembly that uh, uh, sticks the impeller into the sphere. And over here is the motor that drives that impeller. Um, pretty much everything you see on this side of the sphere is reproduced on the other side of the sphere. You just can't see it in this photograph. Everything else that you see here, these lines are uh, heating and cooling for the experiment. Uh, not only do we heat the sphere to get it up to 100 Celsius, but we also need to cool it. Since, as you can imagine, when you stick 150 horsepower into a uh, small volume of fluid, it's not going to take very long before the sodium heats up. Sodium does not have the heat capacity of water, and so it doesn't take long for it to start to rise up. The conductivity of sodium drops quickly as a function of temperature, which is a very common feature of liquid metals. So we actually try to run the experiment as close to melting as possible without freezing the sodium because that's where the conductivity of the sodium is highest. <laughs> so what does the data look like? What do we have here? Well, the data you see here is an applied magnetic field, that axisymmetric field that I mentioned before. On the right-hand side is a time series of one of our runs. <laughs> At the beginning, the motors have not yet started, and on this plot are six of those radial magnetic field probes on the surface of the sphere at six different positions in theta around the uh, latitude of the sphere. At the beginning of the plot, the motors have not yet started, and so all you see is the applied magnetic field uh, from the two coils. At about uh, time equals seven seconds, you can see that the uh, motors start up. And the sodium is very effective at generating its own magnetic field. It's induced fields that are very distinct from the fields that were applied. It's quite, been quite successful at advecting the field. And if you look at the internal magnetic field measurements, you'll see that there's a great amplification of the field in the toroidal direction, especially since we can't apply toroidal magnetic fields uh, with a simply connected experiment. You'll notice that the two um, time series near the center here, these two probes are near the equator, you'll notice that they're very, very turbulent. There are large, large fluctuations going on there, very likely associated with the two uh, flow cells that I mentioned <coughs> earlier on. We've got these two counter-rotating cells, one in each hemisphere, and at that, um, where those two cells meet is a very turbulent region. You've got these two flows grinding against one another, very likely some Kel Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities going on there, generating eddies that are long-lived, and you can see some of that in the magnetic field data, especially this purple one here has got some big, big activity there. You'll also notice that there's no dynamo. The flow is not magnetically self-exciting. There's no growth in the magnetic field. It's pretty much, you know, reaches some sort of steady state or a very violent state that's not quite steady and just sort of sits there. Now, when we ran this, we were rather disappointed. We had hoped that our flow would magnetically self-excite. Of course, that was the goal of the experiment. 
and we weren't successful, um, at least in the way that we had hoped. There is some evidence that the magnetic field has tried to grow or that the system has attempted to magnetically self-excite if you want to anthropomorphize the experiment, um, which I show here. So what I've done is taken the magnetic field as a function of time and decomposed it into its spherical harmonic components, which is the natural geometry for this um, system. The eigenmode that is most unstable, the one that we saw with the Dudley and James flow, is the L equals spherical harmonic components L equals 1, M equals 1, which is just that dipole sticking through the equator that we saw earlier. Now, if you plot the energy in this mode as a function of time, you can see that mostly it's zero, or pretty darn close to zero, but periodically we get these little blips of growth in the magnetic field, very rapid, and then very rapidly crashing back down. Um, we believe this to be um, intermittent dynamo self-excitation. It's not um, obviously sustained, um, but at least based on the simulations that back them up, we can say that it looks like the flow is attempting to magnetically self-excite. So what we think is happening is as follows. This flow is very turbulent. It's grinding itself around. It's doing all sorts of things that are not working. And then every once in a while, for a couple of eddy turnover times, it manages to find itself in a situation where the field can grow. And then it starts to grow. And then the velocity field fluctuations take over and destroy that growth. And the growing magnet magnetic field decays away. This seems to be what's happening. Um, and unfortunately, this is the closest the experiment has come to magnetically self-exciting. -excite Modifications are underway to the experiment to improve things. <clears throat> now, ah, yes, OK. So this pretty much repeats everything I just said. But one, one thing I want to add is the use of simulations. So simulations, as we all know, can be a very powerful tool for helping us understand systems that are very difficult to diagnose. Um, liquid metal systems in particular are very hard to measure. You can measure the magnetic field. That's not hard. But measuring the, veloc the velocity field, what the flows are actually doing inside your flowing metal, is a non-trivial problem because sodium will eat just about anything you stick in there, um, <clears throat> which of course is not conducing, conducive to taking measurements. You can use ultrasound to measure velo your velocity field. And there's some work ongoing and the experiment to do that. But in the meantime, we've turned to simulations to better understand the problems with the experiment and to try to figure out what we have to do to get overcome them. So for those of you that are interested in the details of the code, it's a th uh, the code used to simulate the experiment is a 3D pseudospectral code. The vector potentials of the magnetic field and velocity field are expanded in terms of spherical harmonics. Um, in the usual way for this sort of system. In radius, we use fourth order differencing, Crank Nicholson for the linear terms, and Adams Bash fourth predictor corrector on the nonlinear terms. We evolved the vorticity equation as opposed to the velocity field equation just because we don't want to have to deal with the pressure. So we take the curl of the, of the equation, and then we don't have to. It smooths things out, things out a little bit for our purposes. The code is incompressible. And we use the usual no-slip boundary conditions at the outer edge and a magnetic field matching to the vacuum solution at the outer edge as well. Um, worth noting, for those of you that aren't so interested in the code itself, is that there are two parameters that describe how this um, how things are going to scale. One, the magnetic Reynolds number. We've discussed that already. But this one here is very important, the magnetic Prandtl number. Magnetic Prandtl number is the ratio of the um, viscosity to the, excuse me, the, the, yes, the viscosity to the uh, electrical diffusivity in the experiment. For high values of magnetic Prandtl number, you're going to be pretending that your fluid is kind of like molasses. And as you lower the magnetic Prandtl number, you're going to get closer and closer to reality. The magnetic Prandtl number of liquid sodium is 10 to the minus 5. So diffusion in a uh, viscous sense is not very important in the, um, in the experiment. But as we will find, as with all simulations, 
Uh, simulating such a low value of the magnetic Prandtl number is a very difficult thing to do because it leads to lots and lots of turbulence, which <coughs> is difficult to handle in a reasonable amount of computation time. So how do we use this code to actually study the flows of the experiment? Well, what we do is we generate a pair of forcing regions inside the code that mimic the role of the impellers. So um, we, these are the equations that describe those forcings. So essentially, we just define this rectangular region that's axisymmetric. And we say, in the toroidal direction, you will generate so much thrust. And in the poloidal direction, you'll generate this thrust, thrust outward near the poles. And you see that the flows that are generated by the simulation are very similar to the ones that we see in the experiment. Admittedly, they're not the same. Um, but they're qualitatively similar, and so we can use them to study the effects that uh, we've been examining. In particular, the code has a knob, this epsilon parameter, that is very powerful in terms of examining the role of pitch. This is sort of the pitch variable um, that describes the ratio of the poloidal to th toroidal thrust. And the analogy to that is your impeller, how f uh, the angle that your blade is in the experiment to generate thrust in the poloidal direction as opposed to the toroidal direction. And we'll see, as we discussed later, or earlier, excuse me, that the, that angle is very important to getting your ratio of poloidal to toroidal flow correctly correct. So here's the energy. This is just demonstrating that, yes, the code works. If you run at a magnetic Reynolds number of 100 and a Prandtl number of 1.5, you can certainly magnetically self-excite, no problem. You turn it on, the velocity field uh, goes up in energy, and then after a little while, the magnetic field energy starts to grow. And then we see a back reaction. The Lorentz force becomes important. The flow slows down, and we get a nice saturated state, which is uh, steady and doesn't go anywhere. Again, Prandtl number of 1.5. This is a laminar flow, not turbulent. We're not quite at reality yet. But it's good to see that um, our system, the simulations, are capable of at least self-exciting in the most trivial of systems. Depends on the um, mostly the magnetic Reynolds number. If you crank up the Reynolds number high enough, the magnetic energy will exceed the kinetic energy of the system. Um, nothing I'll be showing today does that, but well. I don't think so, anyway, no. But that's the main parameter that describes the difference, yes. So where do you put the energy from? For the? Kinetic energy is the only energy available that can actually transfer to magnetic energy, right? I don't follow you. I mean, in terms of energy process, I mean, you have a kinetic energy that presumably just cascades down inside the dynamo, or, and then in the end, basically, you hope to actually excite its magnetic field. Yes. I don't believe so, but perhaps we'll discuss it later. Yeah, it is being stored in the magnetic field. You can get cases where the magnetic field exceeds the magne uh, magnetic field energy exceeds the kinetic energy, at least in a non-dimensional sense. If you no energy is energy, it doesn't matter. Yes. Right. That's what is on the plot. Yes. Yes, very turbulent. <laughs> 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 yeah. It looks similar. The flow in the uh, water experiment, in a mean sense, looks similar to this. Um, there's more structure in a few areas, like near the poles. The, the shape of this curve is not, the streams are not quite shaped that way. But for the most part, it looks that way in a mean sense, if you run your averages long enough. It is 
a very fluctuating system. And as we'll see, this is actually the reason why we believe this system has failed to dynamo. What's the Reynolds number? Fluid Reynolds number? Fluid Reynolds. 10 to the 7. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very inviscous uh, fluid, so very high Reynolds numbers. As I mentioned earlier, the ratio to poloidal to, of poloidal to toroidal flow is very important in terms of getting this feedback mechanism to work correctly. These are four snapshots from that video we saw earlier. And we see that if we tweak that epsilon parameter in the, uh, in the forcing term, we can get a variety of different phenomena uh, with different critical magnetic Reynolds numbers. Again, this is the growth rate versus Reynolds number. And we can see that for certain classes of um, pitch, the flows do not magnetically self-excite. The flows are just not well suited to do that. Uh, but interestingly, as we get down to lower ra uh, ratios where the uh, poloidal flow is weak compared to the toroidal flow. Even at zero, uh, you get um, growth after a certain critical magnetic Reynolds number. This looks weird. This is actually just caused by uh, Ekman circulation. Uh, generates the poloidal flow you need to get the dynamo to exist. Otherwise, yeah, that would make no sense to have a purely toroidal flow that would dynamo. We know that can't happen. Um, so it's reassuring to see that the simulations generate uh, results that are physically intuitive. And um, the pitch angle of the experiment is actually somewhere up here in the 0.4 to 0.5 range. Um, but the curves actually don't go up that. They actually start to come back down when you get the pitch too high. But that's, um, that was the propeller that was used simply because the, these results didn't exist at the time, first of all. Second of all, it was just a boat prop that we modified, and so it was cheap. Um, which is sometimes a concern. You can look at the means by which the simulations um, saturate. So that, this is what the, this plot demonstrates. What you see here is as the system starts to uh, slow down and the Lorentz breaking becomes important, you can look at the critical magnetic Reynolds number of a series of snapshots of your flow. And you can look at the Reynolds number based on the tip, uh, the peak speed of your vo velocity field and calculate that Reynolds number. And what you see, which is rather interesting, is that as the Lorentz braking kicks in, you notice that both the kinetic, uh, the kinematic re uh, critical magnetic Reynolds number comes down and meets the uh, Reynolds number of the flow until the two are actually matching one another, at which point the system becomes stable and the magnetic field no longer needs to grow or decay to have a matching, which is kind of an interesting situation. I guess this might be the intuitive thing you might expect if you had to come up with a mechanism, but it wasn't my first guess. Anyway, it's kind of cool. As we lower the magnetic Prandtl number and the system becomes more viscous, we see other effects starting to kick in. This is an RM of 160 with a Prandtl number of a third. In this case, we actually get what we've been calling relaminarization of the flow. So if we run this simulation without turning on the magnetic induction equation, just run the hydro case, you see that you get this turbulent flow with an energy up here. If you run with the magnetic induction equation turned on, you see that the magnetic field grows in time. And then after a time, the Lorentz braking kicks in, the flow slows down, and the, the, we have the phase transition back out of a turbulent state into a laminar one again. And you kind of get this cool sloshing back and forth of energy between the two. So that's kind of interesting that you can get a relaminarized system. We wouldn't actually expect that to exist in reality, of course, because we're never that close to the transition uh, from turbulence or to turbulence. We continue to lower the magnetic Prandtl number. So remember, the Prandtl number of sodium is 10 to the minus 5. So here are four different cases, 1, a half, a third, and 0.22. Here's Prandtl number one, very similar to that first plot that I saw you, showed you earlier. Now we're on a log plot, so it looks a little different, 
but essentially the same thing. We get this nice growth in the magnetic field energy, the Lorentz force kicks in, and we get a saturated state. As we lower the parental number, here's parental number a half on this line here. It wobbles around a bit, but then it, sat, uh, it too saturates. It takes a little longer to do because viscosity is less important. And same with 0.33, a parental number you can see here. That's this one here. Uh, no, nope, it's this one over here. The magnetic field energy grows, and we get the relaminarization that we saw in the last plot. At 0.22, we see that we get a very different situation. And that's this, the kinetic energy is this top line here. The magnetic energy, this is the magnetic energy of the panel number of 0.22 after it's been multiplied by 50,000 just to get it on the plot because it was down, down in the noise that was used to initialize the run uh, because this system just simply will not dynamo. The magnetic field will not grow in this situation no matter how long you run it. The fluctuation levels are just killing you. Your, the, the mean flow, well, let's carry on. The fluctuation levels are killing you, even though the mean flow should dynamo. So you can run this simulation for a long, long time, and you can take some mean, plug that into your kinematic calculation, and see what you should be getting. So here, you may not be able to read the numbers. This is 200 right here, an RM of 200 based on the flow speed of the simulation. And if you do the kinematic calculation on that mean flow, you can see we've got a critical magnetic Reynolds number around 90. Now, 200 is a lot bigger than 90. We should be dynamoing, in theory, if the fluctuations weren't so important. But obviously, they are, because the system is not magnetically self-exciting. Now, one way, perhaps, we might be able to look at this is to look at the instantaneous growth rate of every single snapshot of your velocity field. So let the simulation run every so often. Look at the velocity field you've got instantaneously and look at the growth rates of each of those. And you can see that for the most part, the magnetic field, should we, we have positive growth rates for the velocity field. Um, but periodically, every once in a while, we get these drops into negative growth rates. Now, our interpretation of this is um, that this is enough to cause the flow to not magnetically self-excite. The idea is that the energy that would be growing, going into the growing mode is now being shunted into non-growing modes, uh, and so the energy in the growing mode can't get high enough long enough to sustain itself. Um, there are other possible ways of interpreting what we've seen. This is one of them. My personal interpretation goes something like this. You've got your two flows. They're grinding against one another at the equator. Now, remember that video we had, right, at the, the animation at the beginning with the two field lines that are evolving and getting stretched and laid back on top of each other. If you take one of these flows, cells, and have it migrate across the equator into the wrong side and take its magnetic field line with it and give it to the other hemisphere, you'll see that these magnetic field lines, instead of getting wrapped and nicely laid on top of the original field line that you had, that the magnetic field line gets fed to the wrong hemisphere, gets wrapped up in the wrong direction, and it totally screws up your entire geometric interpretation of what's going on. This is um, something that you can definitely see uh, in the simulations. The velocity fields will be, for the most part, in a mean sense, will maintain the symmetry across the equator, but regularly you'll see it flopping across one way or the other. Um, the flows are not stable across the equator, which really shouldn't surprise us, given you've got these two systems grinding against one another. Anyway, so we can do a parameter space exploration to see if there's really no hope for the experiment or if maybe we can actually get somewhere. Here, we, here we've got magnetic Reynolds number versus fluid Reynolds number. And you can see that there is certainly a range where dynamos happen. That's this side over here. These blue, blue squares are not dynamos. These are laminar dynamos, and then these are all turbulent dynamos. If you increase the magnetic Reynolds number high enough, a dynamo will reemerge, as you can see. Now, one thing we were worried about is that if this line doesn't plateau like it has, if it didn't plateau and just kept going up, you'd be totally hosed. There's no way you're ever going to manage to get a magnetic Reynolds number as high as the 
fluid Reynolds number. It's just not going to happen. But as you can see, after a certain point, the, the um, graph turns over and we have a plateau. Now, this shouldn't really surprise us when we think about it a little more because the Earth obviously has a magnetic field. The Earth's Reynolds number is, depending on who do you ask, somewhere in this range. And the fluid Reynolds number, of course, is in the next building over there somewhere. Um, so we know that this plot has to plateau at, this, at these Reynolds numbers, uh, at the Reynolds numbers here. The experiment is down here somewhere, um, which makes self-excitation problematic. We're in the 100, 150 range. If we had known, we might have come up here when we had built it. We maybe could have doubled the size, maybe. I probably wouldn't have graduated by now, but it's something to think about. If you increase the magnetic Reynolds number, as I said, the, a dynamo reemerges, but you get a dynamo with some very bizarre characteristics that I don't in, understand, and so I'm just going to throw this out there for your consumption. On the, this plot here is just those kinetic energy and magnetic energy as a function of time. This plot is when you break down that energy in terms of mode number. So this is m equals 1. This is the one we would normally expect to self-excite. We find also, though, that there's an m equals 0 mode that is growing, an axisymmetric dynamo mode that is very um, predominant in the magnetic field. In fact, as you can see, it's actually larger in terms of its magnetic field energy than the m equals 1 mode. Now, we don't really know what's causing this. This is a very odd result, because here's the laminar case that I've shown several times already. Just get your magnetic field growing. If this is your uh, initialization energy here at 10 to the minus 9, the m equals 1, or m equals 0, excuse me, decays away, as you would expect for the laminar case, because the axisymmetric dynamo is supposed to go away for an axisymmetric flow, and the m equals 1 grows. So we really don't know what's going on here. This is an interesting piece of physics um, that we haven't been able to explain yet. It may be related to transient axisymmetric field growth. There's been some work done by Jackson and Livermore over at Leeds where they examined axisymmetric flows and found that axisymmetric dynamos or fields would grow on short time scales, so maybe this could be related to that, um, but it's not really clear. Anyway, to summarize. So we've built a liquid metal dynamo experiment in the Madison, Wisconsin, and it currently does not dynamo. It has successfully run, however, which in itself is a significant achievement to build such an experiment. Um, it has not yet dynamoed. Uh, though there is a possibility we've been seeing intermittent dynamo action, uh, transient magnetic field growth. Simulations of the experiment show that the dynamo ceases as we lower the magnetic Prandtl number, which is consistent with obviously what we see in the experiments. Um, future work will involve using simulations further to explore the nature of the simulations that are responsible for the death of the dynamo and if maybe we can find a way around them. Um, yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. So you have a very specific mechanism in mind for how the turbulence sucks the life out of the dynamo as there's turbulent transport across the equation. Could you run a simulation of half a sphere and then force that in force symmetry so that you can't have transport across the equation and see if that that uh, that could be process. that could be done um, it would be difficult to do with this code because it's spectral. It's hard to. But it's spectral and uh, maybe you could maybe you could do it. That would be a possibility. That's actually the motivation behind the modifications to the experiment is to put a large baffle around the equator to stop this from happening. Um, and whether that'll work or not is not clear. But it's one of the modifications that are ongoing just to do this as you suggest. Um, but I, you're actually right, now that I think about it more, a spectral code, you could run half a sphere rather than a full sphere, I th think. The computer is an explosive and 100 degrees. Right. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> so uh, this idea that you're getting the wrong side of the dipole than what you expected, Lower the magnetic Prandtl number, you 
instead of getting axial dipole, you get equatorial dipole. You do? Yeah. So there are ah. a few studies of this, um, but they only lower it by almost an order of magnitude. So we're talking about magnetic tensile numbers from 1 to 21. So there's no difference between the just and one there. Sure. So it's, it may be, uh, it's sort of the opposite of yours just because of, just because of the sign. It's going axisymmetric to non axisymmetric. That's weird. I didn't know that. Okay. Right, right. Is the Ekman number going down with it, or just the Brandle number? Just the, just the magnetic tensile number. Mm. Okay. So you may want to look at those. That's interesting. Good question. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Hmm. Okay. So what are the time scales that you actually run the magnetic there for? Yeah. How long are you going to run the show? We can run for, we've run for five minutes and longer. Um, Again, you'll start, uh, uh, if I run at 17 hertz or about 1,000 RPM, um, the temperature starts to creep up rather quickly. Um, I w we, but we'll run as long as that, you know, several minutes. And the resistive time of the experiment's about three seconds, so plenty and plenty of diffusion times. Um, thousands of eddy turnover times, of course, or tens of thousands. But. small um, milliseconds it's yeah it doesn't it's <laughs> yeah so yeah there you go <laughs> large the largest set is one over 15 Um, what we, we usually run in a duty cycle um, type of mode, which means you run for five minutes, then you stop, wait, relax, look at the data, and then run again after it's come back down. Um, you don't really need to run for five minutes. It's nice to take long time series to get good st statistics on your data. Um, but yeah, five minutes is plenty. 1,000 RPM is extreme. What's that? The speed? It's been faster. We've gone as hot. Uh, actually, um, courage is what make, keeps us from going faster. Um, the <laughs> stomach of the experimentalists. The uh, We've gone as high as 1,500 RPM, I think. Most of our runs have been up to 1,000. Um, after that, the, exper the experiment starts to disagree. And so you sort of just. Don't go faster than that. <laughs> What's that? It starts to shake. Um, <laughs> um, it's a really terrifying thing to be standing beside, actually. <laughs> Especially. No, well, sometimes we're in the room, but at, um, the um, the sodium's at 100 psi, 15 at, uh, five or six atmospheres of pressure because um, cavitation is a problem. If you have a prop running really fast, especially when you've done modifications to it like we have, you'll end up with uh, small scale bubbles forming in the sodium, which is bad for generating your flow. And so you pressurize the sphere to suppress that cavitation. However, if the sodium should suddenly leak, you're gonna have a fountain, which is not good for anybody's health. So and <laughs> the... Um, Yes, we try to run carefully. That's a, re that's a really, really good question. Mechanical seals for liquid metal systems are non-existent, except for ours. So we have two of a kind. Um, it's a triple, um, a three-layer system of um, ceramic um, faces. That's a question I haven't thought about in a long time. The, um, the first mode of defense is two ceramic faces that are grinding against one another, holding things, holding the sodium inside. Behind that, you've got an oil buffer system, hot oil system that keeps the uh, bearings lubricated and is pressurized relative to the sphere. So it's actually at 120 psi, I think, specifically so that if that seal should fail, the oil goes in instead of the sodium coming out. Um, then behind that, there is a packed um, graphite uh, packing 
that is the third layer of defense. Um, we've never had a seal fail yet. Um, well, as far as we know, we haven't had a seal fail yet. Um, but actually, that's a very good question. These are not common technology, and this mode of operating is avoided at all costs for this very reason. They're very expensive. Yes? Yeah, uh, the, we can go as high as 600 gauss, sorry, 600 amps, 150 gauss approximately at the origin, at the center of the sphere with the um, axisymmetric coils, which because they're closer together, give you a stronger field. Um, it doesn't, it won't do it. The... Um, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean by that. How strong does the field have to be to have the same energy as the? Um, the, let me, let me do, think about that for a second. If we apply our strongest field based on the fields we measure and the fits to them, we're going to get a Stewart number of about 10%. Um, so we would need to go up by a factor of 10. So we would need about 1,500 Gauss probably to start having the Lorentz force matter. Everything I've shown, or all of the data we have, the Lorentz force is not strong enough to make a noticeable difference to anything. Um, so I think that answers your question, maybe. That's a lot of current. That's 6,000 amps, and that's beyond what we have at our disposal. As much fun as that would be, that would be... I would heat up faster than the sodium, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Melt your coils. Um, but more power supplies are on the way. So one day, but after I'm... Oh, it's B squared. Uh, sure. <laughs> that does help. The three meter experiment? That's awesome. Uh, it's they've had fires, yes. Um, the they're a little they're not quite as careful as we are with our sodium. Of course, they so for those aren't those who aren't familiar, there have been two two experiments at Maryland that use sodium. Um, a thirty centimeter sphere. Maybe it was a sphere. No, it wasn't a sphere. UFO. 30 centimeter UFO shaped thing, and then a 60 centimeter sphere. Um, and they have had fires, at least one, um, but not associated with the three meter sphere. The three meter experiment's not running yet. Um, the last I talked to Dan, uh, he had spun it um, with by hand. But that's as far as they've gotten. The plan is to do. Uh, <laughs> it only runs at two hertz, so it's not the outer sphere runs at two hertz. That's what they did. I've got videos. They're really cute. Do, 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 do. Um, the three meter sphere will be supposedly filled with water soon and spun for real to do balancing to see if this is going to work. Um, I certainly hope it does. It's going to be an awesome experiment if it gets running. Um, Three meters of sodium is intimidating. So, um, well, let's see. It's cubic, 27 times our sodium. Whether so, whether you think the same kind of fluctuation um, the it depends what sort of flow you set up. So, the original, I think, the first version of the experiment that will be run will be spherical couette, um, and so it will be a very different system that probably won't ex explore magnetic field self-excitation. However, I just learned of some results recently where people had managed to get a spherical quet experiment to self-excite in simulations. Um, so they may explore that. Um, yeah, that's what I said, too. It's a pretty cool result. The um, other option, of course, would be to have two propellers come in from the top, because there's only one access point in this sphere, and have them counter-rotating in which case you would still probably have the same problems, but you've got 
a factor of three in magnetic Reynolds number, maybe the problems won't be as extreme, um, and maybe you could still magnetically self-excite. I don't really know. Um, you would have to see what you got. Right, right. The, so yeah, it could you could be just hosed either way. I don't know. Um, it, it could be you need to come up with a different geometry of the flow altogether to get overcome this. Um, that's not entirely clear what to do next from that perspective. Um, yeah. The uh, other than the baffle at the equator that was mentioned. Um, and other types of baffles to help control those large scale fluctuations, which are the ones that are killing you. The small scale stuff is just noise. I mean, it burns up your conductivity, but it's not uh, the part that's really killing you. It's very sensitive to the geometry of the flow. So, um, 